We're going to continue to introduce the book of Romans. And so Romans, and uh, we'll go back to chapter 1. You guys hear me okay? No. I'm, I am on. Am I not on out there? Speak up. Well, I can get loud. It's just then it, you know, so I don't know. The gremlins are in the wires again. So Romans chapter number one. It's on. Verse, uh, we, we introduced the book last time. We're going to continue looking at the book. Uh, next weekend is the Bible conference. So obviously we'll take a break from Romans uh, as we have uh, uh, John and dad here and so forth. So, but uh, we're just going to look and then uh, the following week we'll probably do a little bit more and then we'll get into the book itself uh, after that. Uh, we, we come again here to the book of Romans, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. Uh, obviously the writer is Paul and we see that and we understand that. Uh, when you come to the issue of epistles, and the writing of epistles, that, for, that the epistle gets introduced um, in, in that manner in, in, in which you have a, um, who the writer is, by whose authority he's writing. Then you begin to see what the issue is. And he it gives us the issue in verse 11 and 12. That's the purpose of the book here. And then... Then he begins in the introduction. He says, all right, here's what we're going to do, and here's how we're going to do it. And then, he, and then the book starts. The introduction to the book of Romans really runs down to verse 17. The first 17 verses are just getting everything started. Because in verse 18, you have him, for the wrath of God is revealed, and there's a subject change. Okay? And uh, you can look down where he talks about uh, the gospel and, and so forth. And then, uh, so in verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God. And in verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed. So you get that introduction to the book run into about verse 17, 18, right in there. So really the introduction here is, is quite lengthy. Um, and we're, we'll spend some time. So verse 11, for I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. And again, that issue of establishment, the issue of setting the process, starting the process, getting the process of, of getting that mutual faith, that spiritual gift into the, the believers. If you come over to chapter 16... And verse 25, when we come to the end of the book, the end of the foundational book, Paul says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to. So now the, the establishment, the process is complete. The, there's a perm that, and we looked last time about the difference between established and established. And that issue of established with the E is a process of setting it all up, established is now a permanency. So as Paul comes and lays in the foundation, uh, come over to Acts chapter 20. As he lays in the foundation, Acts, and he ends the foundational book, he ends it with a don't stop. He ends it with a let's keep building, let's keep the process uh, of... Uh, Building, and we're going to do that through continual study. And he links into First Corinthians, and he goes into you know we're going to keep moving. In other words, when you get to the end of the book of Romans, you're not done. Unfortunately, there's an idea out there that if you get to the end of the book of Romans, you're done, and you don't need to keep going. You got it all down. So go back to Romans one and start all over again. That's not the principle here by Paul in Acts twenty. This is where Paul writes the book of Acts, I'm, I'm sorry, the book of Romans. But he says something, verse 17, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus 
and called the elders of the church. So he calls the elders of Ephesus over. They come. They have a meeting. Verse number 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. That issue of building you up. I've laid in the foundation. That foundation is complete. It's dried, it's cured, it's firm, it's permanent, but it's going to build you up. It's going to do some building on it. Uh, Come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So there's an issue here. And as we get looking in Romans and, and Paul's finishing in that establishment and finishing in the stabilization, in Ephesians 4, he says he wouldn't have you tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Well, why is that? <laughs> well, how, how does that get accomplished? It gets accomplished by you not being stabilized on a firm footing. It has you being up and down. So if he's going to get you to where you're not tossed to and fro, then you got to have that firm foundation. And we sing a song about how firm a foundation we have and so forth. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. It's interesting, we're his laborers. Don't forget we're laborers with God. Okay? We're working with him. It's not us out doing it, we're doing it with him. We do it for him, we're his ambassadors, but we're his building, his husbandry. According to the grace of God, which was given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. So I want you to notice... The, the, just the building terminology. In other words, the foundation's been laid, but we're not done building. We're, we're, we're still moving. We're still growing. We're, we're still, we, the blueprint's in. The master builder's done his job. He's cleared the, the construction site down in the Southeast Valley, down there where, where we're working. The guys are out there. The, the farmers have all sold their properties off to the developers and they're clearing the ground for 500 homes. And I'm like, how do you water those people? You watered the cows, I got, but how do you water the people? The problem is, is they don't. They're, they're going to run out of water down there. They're already worried about it, and they haven't even broke ground on one home yet. My thing is, is then stop building. <laughs> stop. Don't keep, well, but they already got, you know. So the thing of it is, is, They've, they're out there clearing the construction down. When I was run with the water truck, and we'd go in and we would work in the construction area. And one day the road would go this way. The guys would work all night. Now the road went that way. And if you weren't aware of it going to the, you know, making that dra- change, then you were in the ditch, you know. <laughs> and there were many a nights down on that 202 or early mornings. I'd get there and the, the lights on the water truck aren't the, the best. You know, and it's like, oh, wait a minute, that really got really dark out there. What happened? <laughs> Yesterday the road went that way, now it's going, you know, just enough, and it's like, wow. But the, the thing of it is, is that's what Paul's done. He's cleared the construction site, he's laid in the foundation. I come over to Second Timothy chapter 3, and he says, hey, you need to take heed how you're building on that foundation. You need to take heed on who you let build on your foundation. You need to be paying attention to what's going on around you. And, and that, the, the stuff in 1 Corinthians 3, uh, the, the issues there about the judgment seat, that's really about your involvement with other people. But it's also about who you let build on your foundation. Because we let garbage get built on our foundation. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9 and 10, where he talks about the judgment seat of Christ, that's what you're doing to yourself. 1 Corinthians 3 now is what you're doing with other people, ministry-wise. What are you doing? How, how are your involvement? 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, here's the edifice, here's the blueprint. 
All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect. What is that? It, what is that? Truly furnished unto all good works. That's the design. We're going to start with doctrine. That's where we're at in the book of Romans. He's going to come in and he's going to lay... The foundation, by the way, there in 1 Corinthians 3, we didn't read verse 11. That foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? He's going to lay that foundation down. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, it's an interesting thing. Hold on here. Uh, flip. By the way, come back to chapter 1 of 2 Timothy. Just so you, you don't miss this. Get chapter 2 Timothy 1 and 1 Timothy 1. 2 Timothy 1 and 1 Timothy 1. 1 Timothy 1, verse 16, Paul says, Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a, what's that word? Pattern. All right? You got a pattern. 2 Timothy 1, verse 13. Holding fast the form of sound words. The Greek word for pattern is the same Greek word for form. What are we, what, we're in building construction terminology now, aren't we? Linda takes a pattern and she cuts out the, clo the cloth and she makes whatever she's making. What is she doing? She's following a pattern. She's following a form. Paul says, I'm the master builder. I've laid the foundation. There's a form. There's a pattern here. Come over with me to Romans 16. Back to Romans 16 and verse 25. So when Paul lays in the foundation, and on, on your way, stop at Ephesians. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 19, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Notice that spiritual foundation there. But there's a foundation built upon who? The apostles and prophets. And Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. And then you're going to build on that. Now, this is for both houses, Israel and the body of Christ. So the Lord Jesus Christ being the foundation, it literally comes out over here for Israel. By the way, do they have prophets? Yeah. Do they have apostles? Yeah, they got 12 of them, right? What are they laying in? The kingdom here on the earth, aren't they? So they build a house, that believing remnant, that little flock. There they are. They build the house, right? You and I, we come over here. That's kind of crooked. That's, that's brick. You don't ever want me building anything in your life other than the Word of God in you. I don't see in a straight line. I don't cut in a straight line. I cut three times, measure once, you know. <laughs> That's a joke. You're supposed to measure once and cut, you know, you, okay? Th thank you. Measure three times, cut once. I don't do that. I, I go by the eye, and it's usually crooked. I have a little utility trailer I've had for almost 30 years now, and I put a wood box on it every year or every couple years or whatever. So I'm at the Home Depot getting the plywood, and I'm just pulling the, I need four sheets. I got to get them cut in half. I got to do, you know, I know what sizes they need to be, you know, three feet, blah, blah, blah. So I get home, and one of them goes, and I'm like, so I put it on. I got to use it. I spent the box. So the trailer, everything's straight but one, but one wing, and it goes, 
And I go, hmm, that's going to be interesting to put dirt in that one because you can see through on that side. So I'm over there with a the tarp, shoving a tarp down in the gaps. Why replace it? You know, it's just money. You know, so, but that's me. I don't even look at the plywood right, you know. Linda goes, would you hang this? I go, you got a level? <laughs> you know, anyway, so we come over, and what do we do? We're going to build. Do we have an apostle? Body of Christ. We have Paul. Do we have prophets? Yes, we do. We did. Christ had the office of the prophets until the, the completion of the book. So we have prophets. Where are we going? They're going to the earth. We're the kingdom in the heavenly places, aren't we? You with me? Set, you're in Romans 16, 25, right? Stay there. You're, oh, you're still in Ephesians? All right, we'll go. Stay there. Go to, go to Romans 16, 25. We'll just do it there. Okay? This is Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. This is Jesus Christ in his heavenly ministry. He's the chief cornerstone. Some of this we're going to do again at the Bible conference, but it's good to have it in the Romans record as well. In 1625, Paul says, He's of the power to establish you according to my gospel. My gospel. That's going to be different from Israel's gospel, isn't it? Say yes. Make me feel good. Okay, thank you. Whew. Folks on the internet, they are really here. Okay. He lays in the doctrine about the cross, doesn't he? About his grace. Then he says, according to the preaching of the, uh, according to my gospel, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. Right? So now we have the mystery. Now we have the doctrine about the, the goal the church, the body of Christ, the goal. What, why is God doing what he's doing today? This is the book of Romans. That's the book of Ephesians. You see how Paul, in the end of 2016 of Romans, says keep building? He doesn't say stop. A lot of people like to accuse me and others when we use the established and established to say you're saying you're going to stop at the end of the book of Romans. Paul didn't say that. He says what? Keep building. Now, the next one, and. There's three ands in these verses. That's how you know where, where we're at. And by the scriptures of the who? Uh-oh. <laughs> There's our prophets. Now, the interesting thing there about the prophets, there's going to be some more doctrine. The scriptures of the prophets is, is a big term that encompasses quite a bit really going on. One, there are prophets in the body of Christ at this time writing and making sure that the, the word of God, the letters that Paul sends are the scripture. They're collating it. They're copying it. They're getting that, the book, the scriptures complete. Okay? You can say that that's what the scriptures are. Or you can say it's also the scriptures of all of the prophets, of everything and how we are going to mesh with Israel's program and how we get in, because this is going to be the doctrine of his coming, isn't it? But his coming for who? For the church, the body of Christ. That's where we go and be promoted to glory. That's the book of First and Second Thessalonians, isn't it? That's doctrine. You with me? Okay, so we're building here. And when we get over in verse 25 in a, in a couple years, 
we'll, uh, we'll look at that scriptures of the prophets, okay? Seriously, <laughs> I'm on the five-year trek, okay? So just clear your calendar, and we'll be good to go. Now, actually, I hope it doesn't take five years, but it took almost that to go through Matthew, or Luke, and anyway. So we got Romans, Ephesians, Thessalonians, doctrine. But 2 Timothy, or 2 Timothy 3 also said what? Reproof and correction, right? Well, after Romans are the Corinthian books and Galatians. After Ephesians is Philippians and Colossians. And after Thessalonians, there's nothing because we're in glory. You don't need to be reproved and corrected. Reproof, fix the bad behavior. You're not acting as who you are in Christ. You're not behaving in line with that doctrine about Calvary and your identity in the cross. You're mixing law and grace. So we don't do that. Come up on Ephesians. The goal, you're not thinking about who you are, what's really going on. Colossians, you're not holding the head as who he is. You've come back, brought back in Israel's program. Thessalonians, you're in glory. But we got one more level, don't we? Because who do we have left? Well, we have that issue of godliness. We have that issue of the congregation. And there's Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. As he puts the roof, if you will. Now, 2 Timothy 3, 16 says, All scripture... All scripture is profitable for doctrine, reproof, and correction, and what? Instruction in righteousness. The all scripture is the roof. For Israel, they have doctrine, reproof, construction, correction, instruction. You take the Hebrew epistles, guess what they're going to do? They're going to follow the cross, the church, and his coming. They'll follow it out just like Paul's epistles do. Okay? We're here. We're on that foundation. The Lord Jesus Christ is a chief cornerstone. Boy, this is good. I'll preach this again. So when you come to Romans, that's what you're coming to. You're coming to the foundation here. Okay? Okay? You, you follow where we're, where we're at. So go back to Romans. You have the foundation, and then you've got stories in the edifice. You've got movement up. You've got, you, you've got uh, growth that's designed to happen. The edifice is there. Um, wow. Let me do this like this, okay? You've got foundation. You've got fullness. You've got our future, and you have our fellowship. Four Fs. Usually when you get an F, it means bad news. That's good news, okay? Now, when you come into Romans, that's where we're at. Romans then is going to lay in four foundational peer, pillars. They're going to work now. And when you come to the book of Romans, which you're back in Romans 1, I hope. What's going to happen now, Romans is naturally going to outline itself for you. Okay? And what I want to do this morning is get the four pillars in, show you some things about them, and then next time we'll look at each pillar a little, di a little quickly and a little more in depth, okay? That's the goal. <laughs> I got 30 minutes to do that with you. So you're going to have four pillars that are going to be laid in on our foundation, okay, that are going to make up is anybody in here uh, work with concrete? 
and w with the laying in it and why they do what they do. Why do they mark the lines in the concrete? You know how when they'll make a sidewalk and then every so often they'll score it? Why do they do that? Expansion. Yeah, it'll, it, okay, so a place to save the, 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 the stability of it, see, okay? There's going to be some expansion <laughs> places. There's going to be some places that are going to help us bleed over into the next section and move from one to the next to the next to the end. You follow that? Okay. There's going to, each section has a key verse. Each section is going to have a transitional phrase that's going to move it to the next section. Each section is going to have something to do with the attack of the satanic policy of evil. And then each section is going to have a, a pronouncement of our victory that we have in Christ. So there's that expansion, those, those little crevices that get you from one to the next. Again, I don't do anything with, hard, uh, with building except look at it and go, hey, I need some help, okay? Um, when uh, we put a slab down the side of our house, we have room, and I wanted a place to, to park my trailer and do different things with, and now my old truck sits on it. But I didn't think about the uh, drainage coming off the yard, yeah, everybody just, yeah, ooh. So when we did this back in 05, 06, I wasn't thinking about it. So I didn't communicate, hey, I need help. we got to drain the yard. So guess what happens now? I get a puddle where the house and the concrete meet, right? And it has over time just kind of made that part of the concrete do what? Go down, you know? So that's, that's me in construction. Don't think about it till going, oh, after the first monsoon, going, oh, that's going to hurt, you know. So I have some little pumps I run out there and run the hose down and act like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Romans is going to be very similar, okay? The first pillar, chapters 1 to 5, deals with our issue of justification, okay? And my... Chalk's making a funny movement. Over and over in the first five chapters, the issue is justification. 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 You're a sinner. Justification. Then you come to, to the next pillar, which is chapters 6 to 8. And that's the issue of what we call sanctification or identity. Our identification. And over and over, guess what the issues in 6, 7, and 8 are? You're not that, you're this now. You're not that, you're this now. You're not that, you're this now. And because you're this, you're going to go do that. Okay? Then you have chapters 9 through 11. And that's the dispensational picture and look at the nation of Israel. Because guess what you're not? Israel. You are that. You're the body of Christ. So you're going to have a connection and a movement. Then in ver chapters 12 through 16, you're going to have an application of number two. This is pillar one, pillar two, pillar three, and pillar four. And you're going to have an application in life where you have the ability and the opportunity to have the outworking of what you've learned in pillar number two, the issues of your identification. You're able to go out now and live life as who you are in Christ. So you've got these four pillars that fit into this issue of my gospel. So what that tells you is that Calvary has two sides to it. Calvary, when the Lord Jesus Christ died at Calvary, there's two sides to it. There's the side of your justification, and then there's the side of your identity of life in Christ. 
when you trusted Calvary, he, it, paid, it, covered, it forgave you of your sins, but then you gave you his life. So we are going to learn about the death side, if you will. Israel as well, by the way. That's why you read in Romans 10 that they have to have a preacher go preach to them now. How shall they hear except they hear a preacher? People stumble, bust their spiritual big toe on that chapter. Confessions made with the mouth and all that stuff. And in reality, how does Israel get saved today? By hearing who? Paul's gospel. So there's a justification issue for Israel that sits on that side in the conversation. Then you come over here, and now you got the life side. Man, that is really bad. But I don't like that color. The light, I can't tell the colors anyway. I'm blind. Color blind, so it doesn't matter. I hope the blues and the grays work. <laughs> Linda said it did, but she was half asleep. So, <laughs> hey, I, we're, we're, we're a hot mess at our house, you know. <laughs> so when you think you got it bad, just come on over to my house, and we'll, we'll make you feel really good, Okay. So you have the life side, our identity and the, our application, okay? You see what's happening here? You got a lot going, just, we're just introducing, give you an, uh, an understanding of this book. It's a wonderful book. Come over to chapter 3 of Romans. <clears throat> Each section has a key verse, okay? Each section is going to have a transition fra phrase that's going to move from one to the next. Each section is going to have something to say about the satanic policy of evil. And then each section is going to make a declaration of our victory in Christ. The key verse, chapter 3, verse 26, is the key verse of section 1, but it is also the key verse of the whole book. It is actually the key verse of all of Paul's epistles. 326, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness. There it is. What's the key to everything we do in Paul's epistles? We learn, we study, and our ambassadorship is to say, at this time, we're going to declare his righteousness. That he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. That is the key. That is the crux. We go do things, we're involved in work of the ministry. What are we declaring to everyone? He is just and the justifier, because he's right. He's righteousness, okay? There's, that's the key verse of pillar number one. It's also the key verse of the whole book. It's also the key verse of all of Paul's epistles, if you need one, because that's what we're doing. Come over to chapter 6. Chapter 6. And verse 6, here's the key verse of pillar number 2. Chapter 6, verse 6, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. The whole of our identification is understanding that we are dead to sin. Sin no longer has a grip on your life. It no longer has a ruling authority. Verse 14, what shall... Um, for sin shall not have dominion over you. It does not have dominion over you. When it does, you've allowed it to have dominion. You did that. Sin has been dealt with completely and totally at Calvary. 6.6 six is the key verse. Come over to chapter 11. Chapter 11. Pillar number 3. You guys, I'm trying to go slow. <laughs> and it's hurting. But I'm trying to go slow, okay? It's hurting, it's hurting yeah. <laughs> I'm doing good? Yes, sir. Uh, one is uh, chapter 3, verse 26. 320. And by the way, I'll, I'll let you know, you know, I did, uh, last week Denise asked a question, Bob there. You guys can ask questions in this hour. It's a Bible study, okay? We're going to be looking at things that you may go, hang on and wait a minute, you know, 
and you need to know that you're okay to ask questions. I may glare at you. Don't worry about it. Just ask your question, okay? I, I, um, and a lot of it, honestly, is uh, these lights, they hurt my eyes, and sometimes just through the glasses, it looks like I'm glaring. I'm really not. I'm not mad at anyone, but just ask your questions if you need to. Thanks for the interruption, Bob. Appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir, go ahead. Okay, chapter 11. Verse 11 and 12 are the keys here to the uh, pillar number three. I say then have they, that's Israel, stumbled that they should fall. God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Again, what's happened to the nation of Israel? Dispensationally. They've been interrupted. They've been set aside. And God is right and just in doing it and taking his salvation to, right to the Gentiles. Because Israel stumbled and then they fell and then they were diminished away. By the way, Romans 11 there, 11 to 12, gives you the outline of the book of Acts. Just FYI. If you, <coughs> that's the outline of Acts. Uh, come over to chapter 15. I'll give you something else here for you. Chapter 15, verse number 8. Chapter 15, verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. See that verse? That's the outline of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right there. Then if you write down Romans 16, 25, and 26, which we just did, that's the outline of Paul's epistles. So in the book of Romans, you have the outline of your New Testament. It's right here for you. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. That would have been these guys. Yep, Peter and the boys. Yeah, 1520. Another man's foundation is the issue of what Peter, and there, in, in Paul's Acts ministry, there, there's a point when he wants to go into the Macedonia area, Galatia area, and the Holy Spirit tells him he can't go there because Peter and the guys are up there at that time when you look at the historical situation. So he can't go do that. In, Acts 5, in Romans 15, he's talking about them as well, but he's also talking about other guys in the body of Christ. He looks at the Thessalonians and says, I can't come, There's, I got no place to preach. I want to come and just be with you guys. But he has already been through that territory. So the gist of 1520 is these, is these guys, because it's not time yet. They're in that diminishing period of the book of Acts. Okay? All right, yes. No. Uh, 1625 and 26 is the epistles of Paul's epistles outline. All right, come on over to chapter 12. Here's the key verse of, uh, of uh, the fourth and final pillar, chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So then he goes and he describes out in the rest of the chapters, 12, 13, 14, 15, and the first half of 16, on what it is for your reasonable service, what it's to look like. Okay? Come back to chapter 5. The transitional phrase that's going to move us from one pillar to the next pillar. Each section has one. Chapter 5 and verse 17 is this, pill, is this transition. 517. For if by one man's offense death reign by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. Now watch, here it is shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. The phrase is the issue of reigning in life. The question is, is how do I do that? Pillar two is all about reigning in life. 
You're dead to sin, alive to God. You're dead to the law, alive in grace. You're, you got the spirit working in you. You got some advantage. Chapter 8, how do I reign? He ends chapter 5 moving you naturally into to, to the next step. Come on over to chapter 8. <clears throat> he ends pillar 1 moving you to pillar 2. He's going to end pillar 2 moving you into pillar 3. Okay? Chapter 8, verse 35, and verse 39. 835. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Verse 39, the end of the verse. Shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can we be separated from the love of Christ? No. But what happens to Israel in pillar number 3 in chapters 9, 10, and 11? They are separated from the love of God. They've been set aside. They've, been, they've, they've stumbled. They fell. They've been diminished away. They've, their program has been completely interrupted. You got it? Come on over to chapter 11. The end of verse 34. Chapter 11, the end of pillar 3 is going to move us into pillar 4. Chapter 11, verse 34. 11, 34. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Well, what does 12, 2 tell us that we're able to do? We're able to prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God, aren't we? We're able, chapter 12, we're able to know the will of God. We're able to know his thinking, his mind. See that? We're able to do, how are we able? Chapter 12 through 16, there it is. It tells you how it gets done. Come over to chapter 16. Pillar 4. The book ends, chapter 16, verse 17 and 18, with the connecting verses to go into 1 Corinthians. Each epistle, by the way, links to the next epistle at the end of those epistles till you get to Philemon. Then there's no link between Philemon and Hebrews. Okay, Philemon just ends with the amen. But Paul's epistles link... The Hebrew epistles link. 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they are such, uh, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good works and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. What's happening in 1 Corinthians chapter 1? There's great division. There's the four sects pop up that pop up in every local assembly, by the way. But there's great divisions. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 11, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are in the house, uh, of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. So six, the book of Romans ends with that link end of 1 Corinthians. And now we get into the reproof and the correction. Each section, go back to chapter 5 has a reference to and about the satanic policy of evil, the attack. Revelate, uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse number 3. By the way, because of the attack, then we have the victory statements, and we'll get those here in just a second. Romans 5 and verse number 3. And not only so, but we glory in what? Tribulations also. Knowing. And off he goes. You know what we know something about? Tribulations. Suffering. Trouble. Turmoil. And you know what we know? We have peace with God, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, th by the way, there's the answer to the... But what does the adversary like to use in our life to trip you up? Tribulations. 
Because in the tribulations, you quit thinking like you're supposed to be thinking, and you dump in, and you cave. So there they are. Come over to chapter 8. Chapter 8. He, in, in chapter 5 there, he introduces us at the end of the section, of the end of pillar 1, he introduces us to the fact that we're going to suffer trouble. Don't be surprised when it comes up. Just know, it's, you're, you're, just know you ain't nothing special. In other words, God isn't doing it. It's just the, deep, it's just the course of the world. It's the adversary thing, okay? Chapter 8, verse 36. As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. The end of section of pillar 2. Guess what he says? It's coming, and he ain't saving you from it. Israel, guess what Israel got? Saved from all their mess. We don't. It's coming on you because of who you are in Christ. So guess what? It's all good. Don't worry about it. Relax. Handle it appropriately. Chapter 11. Chapter 11. He ends pillar 3 with this description of Israel. Chapter 11, verse 28. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. What is Israel? They're an enemy, aren't they? They're enemies to the Gentiles. It's part of the program. It's what's happening. Chapter 16. He ends pillar 4. We read verse 17 and 18. Right? The issues of the divisions, mark and avoid, contrary. The reason that those divisions pop up, number one reason, is the issue of pride. It's the issue of gathering that followers. He told the, those Ephesian elders in Acts 20, you're going to be attacked within and without. The within is going to be guys pulling disciples after themselves. The without is going to come and just b- bombard you. But look at verse 20. Paul makes this statement, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. He finally names our adversary right there. He doesn't name him at all through the book. He does right there. Who is our adversary? Satan. The leader. The very one, the very... Ephesians 2, the course of the world, the children of disobedience, the children of wrath, who we, where we were at one time, ultimately will get him. Each section talking about a component of the course of the world, the satanic policy of evil, the attack. Come back to chapter 5. If we're going to be attacked... Well, in Christ, what do we have? Victory. So you have a declaration of victory. You guys following what's going on here? This little connection, the swings here? All right. Romans 5. I was, when I made the uh, thing about we're going to study Romans, I was told, don't do it like we've always done it. So I'm trying not to do it that way. I didn't know what was wrong with the first way, but anyway. (laughs) I don't get it. It's Anyway, Romans 5. Watch verse 17 and verse 21. Here's the declaration of victory. Verse 17, For if by one man offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Verse 21, That if sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. The section ends with victory, with us reigning in life unto eternal life. We have victory, and it's in Christ. Come on over to Romans 8. You probably already know where this one's going, verse 37. Romans 8, verse 37. In my high school growing up, this was our 
we were called the conquerors, and so this was our verse, and uh, they had no clue what it was talking about, but because it says we're more than conquerors, boy, we rallied that in the sports events, you know, uh, even though we were lo- we lose, <laughs> but we're still conquerors. I'm like, okay. Verse 37, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Notice we're not a victor. We're a more than conqueror. When you're a more than a conqueror, you know what you're not intimidated by? The battle. The things going on around you. We're living in victory of who we are. We're a more than. We've taken the circle, more than a conqueror. You know, you conquer it. I, I was watching a movie a couple weeks ago, and uh, the guys come in, and, and it's Rome, and they're, they're trying to take over some territory, and they're trying to do it kind of quietly. They don't want a big war. They've got battles that they've won to kind of intimidate them, and they said, listen, what we want you to do is become a part of Rome. We'll leave you alone. You run your place the way you've been running it, but you owe us taxes every year. And the queen lady says, what are the taxes? And he said, to our benefit. <laughs> but what, you know what that is? That is a more than conqueror. They have come in and conquered the situation, but they've turned it to their benefit. It's one thing to go in and just beat everybody up and take the spoils of war. It's another to identify, hey, if I leave them alone, I can get benefited for a long time rather than the moment. What do we do in our situations? We're more than conquerors. We take the circumstance and we spin it so that we can, then it becomes a, the, the affliction is but for a light moment and it worketh for us a far more exceeding weight and glory. Remember those verses? That's being a more than a conqueror. But in the victory statement, it's not being intimidated. Because what do you know what's going to happen in life? Trouble's coming. How do we handle the situation? We live in the victory of who we are in Christ. Come over to Romans 11. Romans 11. Here's how he ends the pillar, third pillar. Romans 11, verse 34 and, uh, 33 and 34. The statement of victory. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. We have the mind of Christ. It's been given to us. We have victory there. Chapter 16. He ends the book, verse 20, where we just were at. And the God of peace shall, what? Bruise. 1620. Bruise Satan under your feet shortly. He's going to use us in the ranks of the heavenly government to bruise Satan, to destroy, go back to Genesis 3.15, to bruise him, to crush him. And he's using us to do it. And we participate in that. The wonderful part in that verse to me, honestly, is the word shortly. Paul anticipated this being done in his day. He never anticipated it out over 2,000 years later. And yet, here we are. (laughs) And we thank the Lord for that extended days of grace, because that included us, and we have victory. So Romans ends with, watch out, be careful, stay on that foundation. Stay there. Because if you don't, trouble's going to, you can get whacked off of it. You're going to get knocked off of it, okay? Now, come back to Romans 5 with me. One thing, I got four minutes, and we're going to try and do this page and a half, two page here in four minutes. Look at Romans 5. Because what Romans does for us as well, 
is Paul condenses human history in the book of Romans. He will bring it and he will condense it down to what was really going on in that moment. Look at Romans 5, look at verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. What happened with Adam and Eve in Genesis 3? What happened? Sin entered into the world. Guess where it passed? To all men. You and I are created in the image of Adam. We have sin scarred on us. I know everybody, oh, we're made in the image of God. No, you're made in the image of Adam through Seth. <laughs> Okay, I, I know technically we're all in the image of God because we're in the image of Adam. But God had no sin. Adam got sin. That verse nailed you, didn't it? But look at verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. So from Adam to Moses, over 2,000 years of human history, almost 3,000 years of human history, what was the underlining issue going on in that time period? Because with Moses, what showed up? The law. Look at the rest of the verse. Even, even over them which had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Right? Verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. What happened with Moses? The law showed up and said what? You're sinners. You're guilty. But from Adam to Moses, what was reigning? What was going on? Death. Th almost 3,000 years of human history. 2,000 years in the first 11 chapters. About 500 years in the 12 to 51 or 2 there. Into the first part of... <laughs> it's like, holy cow, man. What was the underlining issue? Death. See how he just condenses it down for us? Come over to chapter 1. Chapter 1. And i, I got to hurry. We, I was planning on reading the verses, but chapter 1, you start in verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Paul takes the events of Genesis 10 and 11... And starts in verse 21 all the way to 32, and he condenses down what was going on behind the scenes at the Tower of Babel with Nimrod and all the, good, and all the boys. And when God confounded the languages in Genesis 11, the first six verses, look at verse 24. Wherefore God gave, also gave them up. When he confounded the languages, what God was doing was giving them up. He was judging them. He was turning them over to themselves. Verse 24, verse 26, and verse 28. Three strikes and you're out. What Paul does is he takes some information and he says, you saw that event back there in the Old Testament? Here's what was really happening, spiritually speaking. And he condenses it down. Do you guys see that? Chapter 4. Chapter 4. Verse 1, what shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaineth to the flesh hath found? In the first four verses, he takes Abraham and he condenses down the stuff of Genesis 15. Here's what was really going on with Abraham. What did he figure out? Verse 5, he... Verse 4, now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. What did Abraham find out about the flesh? It ain't his flesh. It's the activity of, of, of Christ. What was going on? By the way, what was happening back there with Abraham? He had Agar, they have Ishmael, and God says Ishmael's not the guy. You knock it off, you, 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 you know, you, you dummy. <laughs> okay, I, we're going to take care, I'm going to take care. See, what, what Paul says is the spiritual thing that was going on. There it is. Verse 6, 7, and 8, he takes eight, uh, David. When David committed the great sin with Bathsheba and killing her husband, adultery and murder, all under the law, condemned to death. Nobody's bigger than the law except what did David learn? Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Isn't that interesting? 
Paul said there's a spiritual thing going on. You take Romans 6 through 8. The Gentiles, there's no law. The, gent- the law was never given to the Gentiles. In chapter 2, he establishes that. The law didn't work. It wasn't going to work. It was never designed to work because the people were the issue. And you see that history of all that information just squeezed down. But it's the spiritual stuff. Not, he's not in the details. Spiritually, what's going on? 9 through 11. What was the purpose of God creating Israel? He gets in there. Chapter 9 of, of Romans is Israel's past. Chapter 10 is their present condition. Chapter 11 is their future. He'll say in chapter 11, Yea, all those in Zion shall be saved. He just took a whole wealth of information and squeezed it into one verse. So Paul, so in Romans we get the foundation, and then we get to go look, then we go over there and we can look at all the other scriptures, and we can make the connections. Romans is a critical book, and it's a book of foundation. Now, next time, because now our time's up, we're over, actually. But that's because y'all were talking before, and we didn't get started. Yeah. yeah. We'll look at those pillars a little, and get the details down in those, each of the pillars and kind of map some of that out for you, okay? And then we'll introduce verse 1. And when we introduce verse 1, we're going to get one word, the first word, Paul. Talk about him, Okay. Romans is a fascinating book. I hope you're reading it. You ought to be reading three chapters a day anyway. But you ought to spend some time reading Romans. As we study it, it becomes a little more real to you and alive to you. Okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And, Lord, I just thank you for everything you've given to us in your son, for the folks here willing to come sit and listen and study with us. And we'll just give you the praise and the glory and the honor and all of that. In your name we pray. Amen.